Hello and welcome to episode 71 of Just Keep Writing. A podcast for writers. Bye, writers. To keep you writing. I'm Marshall. I'm Nick. I'm Brent. And I'm Will. All right, gentlemen. So we've talked about this for a while. Finally, Da-da-da. finally, we've decided to do an episode about a television show in regards to writing. This is still a writing podcast, of course. Uh, but we've been, we've been talking about this for a while around episode 70. We're like, oh, let's do a fun episode about TV or what we're watching. And after some debate, it is now episode 71. And we're going to, uh, Brent is going to lead us through a conversation about the Disney Plus show, Loki. But before I pass it over to Brent, this is, I got to be very clear up front, especially we're talking about TV. People get all upset about this. Major spoilers for Loki. If you have not watched the series by now, Binge it. Won't take you long. Binge it. But we will be spoiling some stuff. So we're not going to spare you that. So So. hit the pause button and come back after you watch it. (laughs) Exactly. All right. All right, right, Brent. What you got for us, buddy? Let's do it. uh, Yeah. So I think this is going to be valuable because any I, I think for writers in general, you should be consuming story in all presentations in all forms because all of them can teach you something. It, even if it's what not to do, you can still learn something from all visual media. Well, not just me, I mean, all media. So whether it's visual, you know, whether it's a TV show, a film, a play, whatever, all of it is storytelling and all of it can teach you something. So um, I'll probably say visual media in this. I know graphic novels can fall into that too, but for the purposes of this conversation, just assume I'm talking about t- television and film. So um, we're talking about Loki. Uh, the Marvel brand is pretty strong right now, but the I think what I'm going to like about this conversation is that when you're talking about stories and short stories and novels, we're all writers, so there's a possibility we might run into these people someday, so you have to be a little more precise in what you say. Whereas with a TV show, we can just be as blunt and critical as possible, so I think this is going to be good in that respect where we can kind of like take the gloves off in talking about this. So with that said, I want to kick it right off and we're going to talk about what we where we thought the show succeeded in its storytelling and where it was lacking and give explanations for why on both of those points. So who wants to be out the gate telling us these things? Well, people while people think I'm going to let Nick go, but I want to I want to talk about something you just said, because. I run an, I've run i run another podcast, talk about geek and pop culture for a long time. And I think what you said is really interesting because the 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 f- chances of you running into a showrunner or a writer on a TV show, e- even if you go to Comic-Cons like I've been, is slim to none, right? You might meet them for 30 seconds or something. But in the writing world, you're absolutely right. If we're talking novels and short stories, we all have authors in our lives. I think that's really interesting to think about. And... I've, I'm always the type of person, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this for a reason, I'm always the type of person when I'm talking about TV and movies, I only talk about things I like, and so I try to talk about them in a positive light, but sometimes I'll have a couple little things, but I never know why I say that, only in that I want to respect the fact that somebody created this and put it on the TV, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I could be one of those jerk guys who just is mad about everything all the time, but that's not why I consume television and movies and why I like you know, geeky shit, you know what I'm saying? So I just wanted to thank you for what you said and I'm gonna let Nick go first, but um, I do have comments on this. Go ahead, Nick, you're the man, you go. Brent, where do you want me to start again? You asked like- Okay, so basically where you felt the show succeeded in its storytelling and where you felt it was lacking in its storytelling and why on both. Okay, succeeded. Character arcs, characters, distinct characters. I think that was- I mean, we all know Loki, right? Um, we all know like the bad side of Loki in what we've seen in the Marvel films. But I think, I think what I like most is is the different nuanced characters that they brought in that were just so unique, and how he interacted with them. Because who's he used? Who is he used to interacting with? Gods, Avengers, other evil people that want to control the universe, right? And these people that he was talking to normally are his quote unquote subjects, right? And so you see this very unique dynamic there and they know this, they know this about him, 
and the way they interact with him, I find really intriguing and interesting. Um, as far as where they lacked, and this is a harder one because I really enjoyed this series. Uh, I really did. Um, but I'm going to have to say at the same time, there, there were some instances as far as storyline goes that just were strong. I didn't believe. Um, and what, one of them is the fact that no one knew the timekeepers were robots. Sorry. Didn't believe it when you find out the head of the uh, TVA didn't really know. And now she's all confused and doesn't know what's happening. I didn't buy into that. So um, that, 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 that was for me, right? Okay. That was where my belief was suspended, but... Okay. Well, no, those are fair points. Fair points. I'm sure we'll discuss a little more. All right. So Will's about I'm to kick roll. my ass. So I'm gonna roll into Will because I will, I will go next. He's fired up. Go. Oh, um, I just have a comment about the timekeepers. What makes you believe that the head of the TBA wasn't manipulated into forgetting who they were? And do you really believe the timekeepers were actually robots? Just no. put that out there. Uh, well, you know, just put that out can there. I, can I respond to that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Respond to that, Nick. Yeah, respond, respond to that. To that. I, yeah, yeah. I always knew there was something bigger than that from the very beginning. Because they were hailed as these marvelous heroes that no one's ever heard of but the TVA and the timeline. Right? And so I was like, okay, it's probably not that. But it's going to lead to something fantastic the way the MCU is set up, I'm like, okay, they're going to introduce the next big bad. All right? And so, in a way, they did. They didn't They didn't do it in a way that I expected, which I appreciate. But, you know, like, I don't know. You, you saw that. You, you see them basically die. And all of a sudden, it's like, wait, there's just three robots sitting on a wall. Like, I know what you're speaking to, Nick. And uh, I actually agree with you to a point. And I'll go back. I'll I'll, I'll jump yeah. in on that. I'll, I want everyone else to get well, this. I don't stuff. feel so dumb now. No, no. There's I'm there's not, very I'm much. Not, a, I think you very much have a point. I you, wasn't look. I, I get I get I get stuck on certain things, and those are my hills to die on. And I don't know why I don't get off of them. But but yeah, I see I, I see where you're coming from, Nick. And I think that is it is a. I I'm gonna let everyone else go first. So I'll go. Then I'll then I'll jump in on that. I don't think you were stupid. That's not why I said that. Um, I just said, do you really think like this whole, the whole series is actually written with beats of a mystery. There's tons of red herrings through this whole series. And that's why it's carrying over to season two. The yeah. Whole- but I, Go ahead. what I would say though, to that is that it didn't work as a red herring for me and I'll come back to why, but you go ahead. Okay. So I think, um, Loki is written completely like a mystery. It has all the beats. That. It has all the beats of who done it. You know, it is structured like a mystery. You know, and the way that it was ended, it was ended on um a cliffhanger, you know, so that you pick up the next mystery of it. Because now Loki has to solve how is he going to get out of this one universe that he got thrown into again and what is happening to all the people that he knew the relationships that he knew what is going on and if you think about back to the core of the series the core of the series is a mystery that's how the beats of the story go so that's why like when i talk about do you really think they were robots or like to me everything's a red herring until we get to dr strange and then leading right (laughs) into loki all right, so but then that's a, that's that's another point though. Yeah. It shouldn't have to depend on other properties. But yeah. uh, go go ahead. We'll, we'll, I got, I got a, a quick follow up question for Will. Yeah, but you you talked about it ending on a cliffhanger. Can you talk about which cliffhanger? Because I feel like there was two at the end. Oh well, what do you mean? I, I mean, all the cliffhangers, all the questions that you've asked were on purpose so that it would lead into something is season two. Only one aspect of it is actually going into Doctor Strange. Okay, so so where did you feel the story was lacking? Because you've defended the points about the plot beats here, but 
I don't think I'm defending. I'm just saying that like when you look at it, it's a mystery. There's lots of plot holes that were really bad. Um, I think, I think there's certain things that they completely did wrong. Um, Sylvie, we should have had more of a story for her. You know, we got this little bit that was really interesting, but I think we needed a lot more about her character. Um, I think, um, my other biggest thing is that just we needed to hear more in in this to um, know about the other people in the TBA who were um, brainwashed and kidnapped. I think there's a lot more that they could have just done with that. And I don't even mean a lot more. I mean, they could have just given us just a little bit more. And I think to your point, Brent, is that Marvel – is depending too much on leading into other things when really they should try to create shows that completely stand on their own and has little tidbits of what is to come. Uh, just because you just said that now and Brent said something a minute ago, before I go into my thing, do you think, and I want what you just said, Will, to be a thing. I want them to be able to create a thing that stands alone and is just a thing that we see. I think the closest we're going to get right now is what if, and I don't know if you guys have watched the first episode of that. Um, it's because the way that they have structured the MCU, you almost can't have a standalone thing that doesn't tie in anything because I, I have a question. Why is that the case? And is it because that we are expecting it now? Like what if, Loki tied into nothing. How would how would how would we respond as a fan base considering everything is tied into everything at this point? It just really wouldn't make sense. So to have Loki the way that it's structured, not to lead into anything else. Right. Because I'll we say, all know and, and by giving us the titles of the next phase too, we know a multiverse of madness is coming. We know that all this is going to tie into all these multiverses. So all this made sense with Loki and everything, right? So what I'm saying is if Loki didn't end in a cliffhanger, didn't lead to something else, the, what they're doing, which is brilliant and diabolical and also kind of shitty at the same time, is making it so there's going to be something that someone who didn't watch any of the TV shows is going to miss out on when they get to Doctor Strange. They're going to have to either backpedal and explain something or they're going to have to expect everybody now to have watched everything, right? Well, let me ask you this, right. though. They didn't, with the Marvel TV series, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., they didn't bring a lot of that into the movies where I felt like I had to go watch that series. That's right. because it was Marvel television yep. and yep. not Marvel Studios. And that is something specifically why Jeff Loeb was trying to do that. Right. But um, because of the Daredevil, Netflix and everything, mm -hmm. Defend, was, all the it, Defender it was, stuff, it was more of a corporate level um, misfire. Yeah, that was uh. their only. So that stuff is kind of I don't want to say not canon, but not really MCU. It's not I mean, it's not canon. It can't be because it's not it came at a time where they weren't. So frustrating, though. Yeah. Good. So now, now with the Disney Plus stuff, that's all canon well, the Net MCU stuff. The Netflix, the Netflix stuff isn't. Is act no, actually, uh, Charlie Cox is in Spider Man. Are okay. you? Are you? So, but what? And that's fine. Is that so public knowledge. Think about what they're doing, though, Nick. Before you get all worked up, this they're doing the exact same thing that Star Wars did. With no. the uh, with the uh, legend stuff, they're going back and grabbing things here and there. They went back and grabbed mm -hmm. Thrawn. They went back and grabbed Rex. They they went right. back and grabbed these things, and that they can use as canon, even though some of the stuff wasn't right. I I'll say this about the Netflix MCU stuff. Loved it. I love Charlie Cox. Love Daredevil. Oh, like Daredevil. Was, really I, I'll I tell you what. I love Jessica Jones. That shit was. That shit Luke was Cage, fine to me. Luke Cage was don't, everyone's on the same page about Iron Fist. Wrong it casting, sucks. terrible writing. Like the, Colleen the Wing, character was sucked. The yeah. the girl who played Colleen, I forget her name. I don't know why I love her. Um, yeah, 
yeah, she, she was, was awesome. um, she was hands down. They should have made her the fucking iron fist. Right. Um, but let's talk Brent. Brent needs to give his opinion. So right. let's go. Yeah. Well, no, I, well, no, I, haven't, I haven't given mine yet. Yeah, I was say Marshall. Uh, yeah, we, we got, we, Marshall diverged us a little bit, but I'm we're sorry. Gonna bring it back. No, and, fine, and, fine. and the only reason I did it though. I, I did it for a purpose because I think it's important because what we're all saying is something that's going to keep coming up is that the MCU now is heavily reliant on having consumed all the things. They haven't gotten to where you have to consume all the, the, the comics right now, right? I don't think they would ever do that. But now that we're at the point to where if you haven't seen WandaVision or if you haven't seen Loki and, you, and, and whatever else is coming, you're going to miss something in the, in the, in the movies, right? Um, but now that I think about it, Black Widow is standalone. That's the only thing that they've done that really doesn't it explain. I, I disagree. No, no. What, what I mean is you don't have to have seen Black Widow to understand any of the other stuff, right? It's more of a, this, this thing happened during this time, but you could, you could go without it. Or am I, or am I misspeaking here? Uh, I would say for now you're probably right, but that I, I'm, yeah. I'm like almost sure stuff from that is going to yeah, lead to other. Yeah, it, right. It's it's. I think Black Widow is more less. Will looks like he wants to say stuff. Yeah, but he can't. you saw the post credit scene. I mean, yeah, the post credit scene's everything to me. Yeah, yeah. It, the, Black Widow is more of a story of Yelena. Yeah, for sure. That's true. Natasha. And when she shows okay. up again, you would have to. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So, and it's Black Widow. It's a whole organization. So yeah, it's yeah. not really just Natasha anymore. Which I dug, by the way. We should talk about that soon. Okay. Yeah, good movie. Will, um, you want to say anything? Will? Can you say anything? People looks not like benefiting you, from the video feed are really missing some Will. It looks Will, like Will, you got something here. sour in your mouth and you don't want to spit it out. <laughs> no should I say my thing then? Okay, yeah, I'll say my yeah. thing. Yeah, say go, go thing. Jump into your Loki stuff. All right, so Loki, back to that. Sorry to, to, to and I was the one talking about time limit on this one. Um, so the one thing I want to say is this. Uh, I really, um, I think what they really did well is capturing what it is to be a Loki. And I know it's kind of a weird thing, but they made a Loki a thing. Like, if you're a Loki, you have these traits. You can be anything, but you're like, inherently, they really, they really made Loki a, fun freaking thing to be alligator loki couldn't be more happy with that i don't know what about it but it's like yeah it makes sense that loki was an alligator at some point why am i buying it i don't know but it was fucking cool um so i, I want to really know more that. about that reality if i'm being <laughs> honest like are they all crocodiles right <laughs> or is he um, just stuck in that form <laughs> uh no and and so i think where they really the misstep that they had and i'm with will on this is with um sylvie's character i really think that that could have been really really paid off a lot more than it did and it seemed like at some point she was just kind of sitting around and i just felt like her character didn't come through in the way that i hoped when i heard like lady loki was coming i was like oh cool we're gonna get this thing and it never really paid off um for me uh, I love Owen Wilson, by the way, and I will watch him in anything. And I love the Mobius character. I just, I mean, those two together, it was so fun. Those first two episodes with them palling around together was really, really well done. Um, when he left, it made me kind of sad. But anyway, that's all I got for that part. Okay. All right. So I guess for me, where he succeeded was, um, I mean, for the characters i guess the characters were very strong and i mean jonathan majors just gave a chilling performance at the in that last episode hell yeah um where it fell short for me was that i i did not feel like the uncomfortableness of that romance with sylvie was explored enough because it made me very uncomfortable that was there, I just felt like it was like, ha ha, joke, joke, you're in love with yourself. And I'm like, no, 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 that's that's weird. We really need to dig into that. Like, that's not, I'm not going to say it's not okay, but it was that's just weird. a lot of questions to open up there. Though. Yeah. And no, I'm but like, I think that's weird. where they could have done the Sylvie character a little bit more is like, why is she attracted to this version of herself? Right. right. I think right. that would be really Loki interesting. Thing. You just right. love you. Right. And well, and I, and I, you know, they kind of made like a little ha ha, of course you would joke, but I'm like, no, 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 this, this needed to be examined a little more. I think in fact, 
to me, honestly, the whole Lamentous One episode was a complete waste. That story had no purpose. What it 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 gave this veneer of a metaphor about oppression that wasn't really followed through in any meaningful way. It just it just did not work as an episode, and I think it was probably the weakest point of the whole series. So yeah, that that episode made me groan. I was just like, what's the point? It was, was tough nothing. though. It was tough. The third and fourth episodes were a little rough, I think. And have the third episode be I felt similar to you. I still, you know, I watch I'll watch it either way, but like the fourth episode, um, that was the one where they were on the planet kind of waiting for it to die, right? Yeah, that laments is one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, was that the one that you're talking about? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That was you're right. And have that being the third episode. Is like you get people in with the first two, and then you give that as your third. You may not get people to come back for the rest. Yeah, no, it had absolutely no purpose, really. Like it, it, it if this, and it, it seemed like such a waste of opportunity because going back to our last episode where we talked about the short story and how the setting breathed and lived and added something to the story, that episode could have been a huge opportunity to create a setting that really, really establish some character and story and it didn't do any of that it just felt like a it was pretty it was a very pretty episode but it just didn't do anything for me storytelling wise can we just talk about the 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 throwback line to thor one where he has a drink and says another oh yeah yeah, Yeah, that was was the highlight of the episode for me like (laughs) that was actually cool the rest of it i could have done without yeah no it was uh yeah it was rough it was a rough episode Okay, so we talked about where we felt they succeeded and where it lacked. So, I guess next thing I want to talk about is more of a um, more of a craft storytelling thing. So, what were some things that the show did with its visual storytelling that you think would be hard to translate to prose storytelling, and why do you think it'd be hard to translate it? Where do you come up with these? That's a good question. Brent. I will God, between you and up, Will. Damn. Well, the reason I came up with it too is because you know I, I I'm always you know me I'm always about like how do we improve ourselves how do we level up as writers and like I think really interrogating the media that you consume and watch and figuring out these different things really can help you level up. I you know honestly visual media versus written right the hard part for me and I don't. Uh, on the spot questions, right? I don't know what these ahead of time is Loki's mannerisms and how he, look, I don't look at them ahead of time. Will you looking at me like I'm crazy, but I don't preview questions on these because I love, I don't want to stew on them. I do the same thing. Mostly it's for time, but I, I did the same thing this time. I just looking at him right now. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I know we have a show outline. I'm the guy Ask me a question. I'll give you the top of my head answer, Brem, but Brem Loki's manner is into this. No, I no, I, know, you know, I didn't look ahead of time. It, I, it, I For this type of conversation, I'm with Nick because for me, I want to know that there is an outline and there's a structure, but I want to – look, I have a pop culture podcast, dude. I love just <laughs> asking random shit and having a conversation about it. You can flip me off all you want. God, I wish I was recording the video on this. Okay. You're not? So, Why not? Back, back to I Nick. Mean, I'm totally okay if you guys are not looking because for me, the outline is more for me to remember, like, yeah. the structure yeah. how I'm going to keep things on track. Well, so. and, and, and you keep us right, on nice track. Cover, I like, nice cover. I, <clears> I, nice cover. I like it. It really is because I would not remember. There, there's no way I would remember to ask that question without the outline. No. And it's pretty bad because I'm always like, is there an outline? Is there an outline? Is there no, an outline? Marshall, yeah, so you know what? So you know what? I don't want to hear in any other future episodes when I do a f- when I said no, I'm gonna just surprise you with questions that I don't want to hear grumble, grumble, grumble from any no, one of you bitches. I just want okay? proof that there's an outline. Literally just go fuck yourself. I'm not doing it now. Look, you guys, I'm the guy that doesn't no, need that outline fun. unless I'm running the show. Like okay. ask yeah. me the questions to have a conversation. That's fine. So so Loki's okay. mannerisms. Let's answer the question. Go ahead. I, I'm trying. Loki's mannerisms, right? Mm-hmm. You, we see how they change episode to episode to episode. We see the awkwardness. And I think that's something that Tom Hiddleston does really, really, really well is being able to show those small little things that he does with his hands. The way to like the way he puts his hands in its pockets. Mm-hmm. Just look at that throughout the series. Like it changes how he wears a jacket, what he does with the jacket, like how his tie is, like you know, just his, his clothing and how that changes. And, it, you know, for me, how how do you translate that? How do you translate a character's arc that's changing 
and have it physically manifest without it being very blunt. I'm tempted to to talk about a character too, but I want to stay with setting kind of, I think it would have been sometimes you don't. Okay. I'm going to tell you why this question is difficult. It's because if, if like, I'm not the biggest Harry Potter fan, right? Obviously, you know, but like my wife and kids, we watch the, I mean, I watch the movies and stuff. Um, I can use a different example if you want. Will, if you want me to ignore. No, I just ass. fucking hate her. No, I, yeah, I do too. We, Don't worry. We hate, this is and the I'm, one author we can <laughs> objectively hate out loud. I'm not no cutting this, by the way. Um, but yeah, so you're right. Um, so, I, you know, you can watch Harry Potter and, you know, and you guys may have read the books. I didn't. I think. I don't know how much of what they captured on screen speaks to what was in the book. Right. So, and so that's, and that's, so Will is putting a thumbs down for those of you not benefiting from the video feed. So I guess what I'm saying is how the, the look of the TVA, I really, whoever did this, the the cinematography, right. Just everything very bland, just like how, I don't know. I really got a sense of a really crazy shitty bureaucracy that was running really, really well. You know what I mean? And like everybody was just, and I don't know, I know you can capture that via text, but like I said, if you were writing that and then you turned around and filmed it, I don't know if people would buy into it as much. So we were kind of reversing it right now, which is why this question is difficult. I'm going to go with the he who remains at the end. I don't know how you pull that off dialogue wise and capturing that manic, crazy monologue at the end well not on screen because you have to have that i feel like you got to have that visual attached to him uh to pull that off but that's just me no that's why i want to hear because i think it's i think this question is also good because it also makes you think as a writer like the stuff you think is hard is probably stuff that if you worked at it would definitely improve your writing. Like I, I would even challenge you to just attempt to write that out in prose and see how it turns out. And then you could kind of like compare and contrast almost. I think it'd be right. a cool exercise. Um, okay. Well, what do you think would be hard to translate from the visual to the prose mm-hmm. from this show? Um, the hardest thing to translate is when all the Lokis are together and the alligator Loki. Because it is the visuals, it is what, not just the visuals, but it's what the actors bring to that scene who are playing the different Lokis that makes it challenging writing prose, right? So I think for prose, how it would be really difficult is you literally have to paint such vivid pictures and have such vivid dialogue without weighing that scene down. And that is very hard in prose versus when you are on screen and you have actors to emote this because they're doing so much acting and there's so much visually that's happening when they're all together that that would be a really hard scene because when you think of when you're writing scenes as a prose writer, you're controlling the viewpoint of the reader. When you're watching something, the director might have it honed in on um, main Loki, but it's alligator Loki on the side. And it's, um, you know, old Loki, old school Loki um, in the middle that they could both, you could both turn your eye into different places. And that is what's really hard about prose because you would have to single on one thing in that scene, that one Loki, and then describe each a certain way where in comic books on, um, because that scene is from a comic book. Um, yeah. And um, the screen, you don't you don't have that control. You know, the director doesn't even have that control, you know, because there's so much things going on. Yeah. And 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 the scene you're talking about is where all they're all sitting in the lair or whatever. And they're mm-hmm. all, that was one of my favorite scenes. And you're right. How would you how would you capture all of that? You know what I mean? In prose, I, I think. I don't know. I just uh, the dynamic between uh, old Loki and uh, young Loki, the other one? baby o- little Loki. Yeah, just, when they're Eat like, Loki or- when, yeah, when they're like arguing in and shit, and it's just like, how do you how do you pull that off when you have all that going on at the same time and you're trying and you're writing prose? Like, I don't know. I'm with yeah. you, Will. Well, in an effort not to repeat anything that you guys have said, Miss Minutes would be. Um, 
hard to translate. I thought about that too early. (laughs) Miss Minutes, what works is that there's this image of this very innocent, like 80s commercial image. And then like some of the dialogue she delivers, it's like, oh my God, this is creepy as hell. Yeah. I don't know how you would, if you were to do that in prose, what you would, what it would really depend on is you would have to create such a vivid image in the very beginning that it never leaves the reader's mind through the rest of the story. Yeah. And that would be the hard part to pull that off. I think so I don't know if you guys noticed this, I know this, but you know, Miss Minutes was actually, uh, it was inspired by an actual cartoon uh, drawing on posters from Germany in World War II that the Nazis used as propaganda. No shit. Mm, yeah. I love it. And that's, that's actually also taken from uh, a John Ramada uh, drawing from back in the day in like the 60s, mm. which yeah. is super fascinating when you think of like how layered John yeah. Ramada was influenced by what Germany was doing, put that in one of the stories, and then it was expanded upon. So, you know, there's like layers there that I thought was really interesting. Yeah, no, that 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 to me, I was like, I don't know how I would pull that off in the story. Or if I was to try, I know the 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 linchpin would be creating that image initially and making sure it sticks in such a way that it never leaves their head for the rest of the story. Mm-hmm. So that would be difficult. Do you think? Um, like, do you remember in that book from George Orwell, 1984, when there's the Big Brother posters mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and there's the speakers? It's like, that's the only way I can think of that you would yeah. be able to create something like that. But when you read that, it's actually still really hard, I think, when you have this great big galactic story to right. really infuse that in such a way that is so fluid and flawless. You would almost have to create a scene dedicated just to Miss Minutes to pull it off. Yeah. You wouldn't be able to insert the character into any random scene. Like it would have to be something very much dedicated to we're introducing Miss Minutes. She creeps us the fuck out. Like now yeah. we can move on. So yeah. All right. So inverse of this question. What do you think would be easy to translate from Loki visual storytelling to prose? Mm, I, I, I would. Oh, go ahead, Will. No, you go. No, I was just gonna say, like all the big. I, I don't. I don't want to say it. Like all the big set piece, kind of special effectsy kind of stuff, like jumping through portals, um, going to different planets, that kind of like the setting stuff. Um, outside of, I think the feel of maybe like, I don't know. I I kind of got a similar feeling, and I'm glad you brought up 1984, Will, because I taught that for years that feel of that bureaucracy where there's just like people sitting at a desk doing work. Like I think outside of the feel of that, I think those big, you know, the explosions and the, and the jumping from portals and stuff like that. I think that's pretty easy to tell story wise. If you're just, especially if you're world building the right way, you know, cause you want people to have that visual, you know, when they're reading, it's like, this is what the portal looks like. It looks like a sort of three dimensional orange door thingy and people jump through it, you know? Um, I think that stuff is pretty straightforward, in my opinion. Will? I think it's what you could do really great in prose and actually make it better is that interaction with Loki and Sylvie, specifically the uncomfortable parts of them kissing. I think that in prose, you could really get into the mind of those characters and really extrapolate that. And I think also just in prose, very simply, you could just extrapolate about Sylvie. Like, do you know what I mean? Like you can just do certain things with that character in prose that would just instantly make you more connected and feel more familiar. This is, this is part of my next question. So I'm glad you brought it up, but yeah, I'll, 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 I'll let Nick you, go first. You, you, you stole it from me. Um, I mean, granted I'm reading romance right now for school. <laughs> so like that, that hits home a little bit more home to me now and how that relationship could be more defined. Um, so I'm actually going to go with the scene where Loki's put into this time loop. Um, because I think there's a, there's a huge piece of character development there that we get, but we don't actually get to see. And, and I think that's a piece where you could have a lot of fun playing with, um, you know, why is he choosing the words that he's choosing? 
why is he trying to go this route? Like, what does he know about Sif versus how does he know Sif is going to react to him every single time? Um, I think that's a a huge, huge piece that would be fun to kind of play with and really, really work out the the internal monologue of Loki because that's that's kind of a point where we do see a big shift. Something happens there for him where it shifts the rest of his character development. Yeah, no, ag- agreed. I guess mine would be kind of, um, I just feel like Eliath would be pretty easy to translate the prose, that whole concept of the all-consuming time eater or whatever. I think that would be my pick. So, yeah, that one's kind of simple for me. You like but, your monsters. Yes, I do. So uh, to kind of bring it back to what Will brought up, so my next question is, imagine you get asked to adapt the Loki TV show into a novel. So what parts of the show, because obviously you're going to have to expand. So what things from the show would you, in your hypothetical Loki adaptation novel, would you expand upon? Yeah, you go, Marshall. I would 100% expand on the relationship between him and Mobius, for sure. Um, is it Morbius or Mobius? I always get that Mobius. Up. Mobius. Um, I think there's a really fun, because I, I feel like, part of the novelization of this would be to keep the lighthearted elements for sure. I think part of the fun of the beginning first couple episodes is the sort of buddy cop aspect of those two, you know, like, like how well they got, a, you know, they didn't get along at first, but now they do. And now they're going on an adventure together. That shit was fun as hell to me. And if you can capture the Owen Wilson, you know, persona in prose, um, would be real. I mean, obviously, people. If you were adapting this, they'd have that image in their head anyway. But if you could pull it off on the page too and expand on that, I think that'd be fun as hell, for sure. That's my knee jerk one. I have others, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like it, Marshall. I like it. That's a a good one to hit on. Yeah. What about you, Nick? Um, yeah, I would like. Maybe this is a demented side of me. But when Sylvie unlocks someone's mind and shows them their memories. I want to know interrogation tactics. Mm. I want to know what they're talking about. I want to know what's going through their head. Is she really crazy? Like, I want to know the propaganda that's surrounding that to make, keep people under control. Um, You know, because yeah. that's, uh, that's essentially what they're doing is telling everyone. Now, Sylvie makes you crazy. This Loki's <laughs> out of control. Look at her. <gasps> She's crazy. And it's like, to me, it's just like, it's really consistent. Everyone's saying the same things over and over again. Like, you know, like how do they keep that in check? How do they keep that balance of control? Yeah. I would say, um, besides the Sylvie getting in her, I think the internal conflict that Loki is having specifically knowing that he died in one version of himself. Uh, his mother is gone. Odin is gone. Um, and the loss of his family. I think that's something I would really strike about because you can tell, and this is what's a great thing about Tom and the way that he acts. You can see that in the way that he is acting, that struggle, right? But I think writing prose wise, because we don't have an actor, I think we can really delve into that and deepen that. Because when you think about a lot of uh, novelizations to screenplays. It's not just about adding extra scenes, but it's also how do you deepen what's already on the screen? How do you make it a little bit more nuanced, a little bit layered, and a little bit more thoughtful so that people can see the film, read the book, then look at the film and be like, oh, wow, that's what they were thinking. You know what I mean? That's what I think. Yeah, no. Yeah. I guess for me, I would, um, I guess mine would be more of a world building expansion. So something that bothered me about the show is that they're supposed to be guarding the timeline for the entire universe, but all of the agents are human. It's like, why isn't there a Kree agent? Why isn't there, um, you know, uh, a scroll agent or why isn't our, and then, you know, I was also thinking too, is like, well, how do you deal with a variant of a celestial? Like, can you even take that out? Like, or how do you deal with, you know, I would, I would just build in more of like, just expand the world to make it really feel like the TVA is policing the entire universe and not just different versions of earth. Like I was really excited at one point in the series where they, 
where they were showing like when Sylvie and Loki had their moment that caused all these divergences. And you could see in the background some of these different timelines. And I saw like some of the alien worlds. And I was like, oh, it would be really cool if we saw like a, a variant of Titan or something. Like mm-hmm. then it was like they it just felt like a missed opportunity. And I get it, budgets, you know, real world concerns and whatnot. But if I was doing a novel, we wouldn't have those concerns. So you could kind of really expand it. Cause I love that line when Mobius mentioned Cree vampires and you know other things. I was like, ah, that's really cool. So that would be my thing. I would definitely expand on that. And I I would really show more of Sylvie being a threat because one thing to show that I another thing I think maybe it was kind of lacking in for me is that they said she was this this huge threat to the TVA, but nothing she really did felt like a threat necessarily yeah. that justified her being the supposed badass. Like it seemed like most of the time she was just running. I was like, is she a runaway or is she a, is she like I was expecting like you know somebody coming in and kicking ass like blowing up shit. and it's like she didn't really justify this all consuming threat to me. But I saw hands go up when I said that, so it must be. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say something, but they had their hands up. Good. Yeah, I, uh, Will, you go first. Well, um, the threat, you, and you just kept feel like she was running. Uh, do you think maybe that is a comment on misogyny? That any time a woman uh, has any sort of power, that they automatically say she's wild, uh, dangerous um crazy i feel like michael who wrote the script could have been maybe and this is up for debate too is that a commentary on the way that we view women in society and also she's the only female loki yeah i've got so many thoughts on that but then you contrast it with ravana and Ravana, Ravana has power, and like if it, I think if there's going to be a commentary on misogyny, there's I think there's more critique with Ravana than with Sylvie, because Ravana is basically in power and she's upholding this power structure, and she knows she's and it's like she's almost complicit, and but she when it comes time for like people to be held accountable. She's really the oh, she becomes the face of that. Like, oh, the woman leader is the one who who needs to answer for why are we all variants? Why are we all duplicates? She's making the hard choices. And that kind of bothered me, too, when like she was the one who kind of pruned Mobius in a way. It was like, oh, OK, yeah, we, we, we want the we want the one. Well, not the one, but the prominent woman of color who's the leader here is the one that's like you know, drinking the juice and is completely sold on this yeah. idea of like the sacred timeline. So I don't know. I, I, if, if there is a, if there is a comment on misogyny, well then I would argue at least for Sylvie, it's very much white feminism. Yeah. So one thing, and I want you guys to correct me on this. Oh boy. I've cut this too. Look, no, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I, hope not. <laughs> I don't find Sylvie's motivation that she was just plucked from her home to be compelling. And this is where you need to correct me as of, as a female villain, it didn't hit home with me, but what did resonate is when she found out the truth of the TVA, it fueled her motivation to destroy it. And I feel like they didn't hit enough on that. It was so much of, Oh, you took me from my home. You took me from my home. You took me, you were going to kill me versus no, you're batshit fucking crazy. And I need to stop you. Like that felt more low key, but it wasn't hit on a lot. So correct me, please. uh, No, I I, 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 I do think that I'm kind of almost opposite of you. I think it was, it was compelling up until she killed he who remains. Then I was like, no girl, you lost me. Like, it, and that, it, I, I didn't understand that either because it's like you have the you have, and not say his explanation makes anything he was doing right, but he is literally telling you, I am not the most dangerous one. Right. There is worse than me that is coming, and if you do this thing, you, yeah, like it, it's going to be so much worse. And and you know, and and and, and that makes now that we, I have some of this background. That was off camera. <laughs> it makes it even more feel like white feminism now because it was like my rage it matters more than anything else. 
And my rage about what was done wrong to me matters more than anything else in the world. I feel like where it was comp- not compelling is that there were no consequences for her path on revenge. Like she literally got to torture that poor TVA girl who ended up getting pruned because of her actions. Right. No consequences for it. She's killed all these agents knowing that they were just victims just like her. No consequences for it. And then she literally kills this guy and is basically about to set off a multiverse of war. And so far, as far as we've seen, no consequences for it. But we're supposed to root for her because she's a she's a woman who's been done wrong, particularly a white woman, because I think it would be it would have been received very differently if she wasn't a pretty blonde white woman. If that had been a a large black woman on a rampage, that would not have been received the same way. I agree. Uh, so question though did she really torture people though well the, we remember that episode the girl was like babbling she couldn't even talk straight like she yeah. couldn't even like she was in like a weird state after after she got in her brain or her head and, and and the thing i would say to that is like if you were really about exposing the tva and helping these variants why wouldn't you hide her somewhere like you've been hiding all this time why can't you do the same for her you say you left her to get caught and to get pruned because that's a, your mission was more important. That's a Loki thing, though, right? Yeah, you well, that's, selfish that's to look out for number one. Yeah, and that's why I think it fell short. Is that there weren't any consequences for being a Loki? Yeah. Our Loki definitely had consequences for being a Loki. Always, like always. <laughs> she really didn't have any. Well, I, well, and that begs the question. And it's a this. There's no right answer here. Is she the best version of Loki out there? She got away with everything. You know, uh, she escaped consequences. She got what she wanted. She finished her en- at her end goal. That's if true. that had been, I think if that had been better layered into the story, then maybe. But it felt like just like I don't know. At certain points, it just felt like there was nothing bland. in her way to stop her. Yeah, it just felt like bland revenge porn. At some points, <laughs> it was like oh, I'm just I'm just gonna tear my way through this with no real consequences and. The only thing stopping me is my love for my another version of myself. That's the only thing that tripped her up the whole time. I don't know. I kind of like that for some reason. I, 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 I don't know like, what's wrong I, with I me. I felt like it was more manipulation. Yeah. At, at certain points, because our Loki that we love, right? You could tell it was there for him. Yeah. I did yeah. not see it fully reciprocated. No, I don't think. I don't think. I don't think she cared as much for him as he did for her. Definitely. Uh, but also if, that fits our Loki too, because he, you know, always looking out for himself, loves himself above all others. Anyway, makes sense. He would fall in love with a version of himself. Yeah. Yeah. The, the perfect Loki. Right. Man. Yeah. But, but I mean, like, Brent, I, I like what you're bringing up about it and, and kind of the nuances there of, of that. Um, and I and I forget that character's name, but the the female security guard, the the head of security. Oh yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. She was a very interesting character. Yeah, a she very was. interesting character. However, it, you know, it's one of those. You know, let's go back to what they didn't get right. They could have utilized her a lot more at the end. Um, yeah, you know, and yeah. and I don't feel like her character would have come up as just as some people would say the, the angry black lady in the show, right? Like she had depth. She had emotions yes will you made yeah, a face but, yeah, I, yeah but i think i think you're right to an extent but i also think like honestly like the way that our country is built and western society is built we you, they could have given her agency and everything else and some group of people mm-hmm. will just be like she's an angry black woman and it's just like oh god you are so boring yeah but i guess uh, i would i what i would say to that though is like it, with those people, sure, there's always going to be that. But I, I, to Nick's point, I don't think they really even tried with her character beyond like the. I think the oh. tenderest moment she had no. was when she was talking to Sylvie and like was like, "What's really going on?" No, Other she, than that, yeah. she was, yeah, she, she no, there I, was almost a throwaway character. And now that I think about it, every woman of color in that thing was in a leadership position, and they were bad at it. Are they were are they were too rough? Are they were corrupt? Are yeah, failing, and even, failing in some way. Yeah. yeah, even I mean, and it's funny because even Twitter like kind of made jokes about Black Twitter made jokes about this after the show ended. It was like, oh, this whole story is about an angry Karen who got mad at a black run co- uh, corporation, and she had to take yeah. her complaint to the manager. 
Because exactly. really, if you think about it, every leadership person was black, and here's this angry white woman raging oh, her way through it all. Shit. Yeah. And, you know, and, people and joke you, about these things, but it's like... You, you can see it, though. But they're not yeah. wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, and again, see, this is the thing, I think, also in the larger discussion about representation and diversity. You can have all the diversity and representation on screen in the world if you want, but if the people handling the pen aren't open to diverse perspectives, that representation is going to fall short. It's also like Bridgerton, how it was colorblind casting instead of intentional casting. Yeah. Right. They used the line, well, we, we casted colorblind. Well, that doesn't help. No, it actually would be better if you intentionally cast it because that could yeah. enrich in your script. So it goes back to what they did on Loki. Yes. Yeah. They colorblinded cast. Yes. They made it, you know, diverse, but did they really? Which the answer is no. You had a no. head writer who could overwrite some of the other writers in the room. Yeah, all the people you were pulling for that are that you, the narrative asked you to pull for were white. Sylvie, yeah. Loki, Mobius. Like, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, it, 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 I mean, the show was definitely, it was good. I hope people don't think I hated the show. I didn't hate the show. I thought it was good. It's just definitely now that, especially now that we're sitting here talking about it, I'm just like, ooh, there, there's definitely some cringy parts. About but this it. is but this is why I like talking about this kind of stuff, though, because I think, especially as writers, it's really important to understand like the discussion around your work and the discussion around intention is going to come up, right? So right. it's like you you might write a you know we had this conversation around your work, Brent. You weren't intending one of the things that we discussed. Oh, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But, I wasn't but, intending ugliness to be evil. But, but the conversation around the work brought that out. It's not, right. your story was wonderful, but that one thing could have been taken in a different way. Right. And now that we're sitting here talking about a show, we all got together before this and we're like, oh, Loki's awesome. Now that we're having the conversation, we're like, well, shit, they kind of blew it here, here, and here. Right. And this is what, but I'll, again, going back to what I said in the very beginning of this episode is I'm not going to go on Twitter and be mad about any of this stuff. But at the same time, I like having these conversations with my friends, especially on a podcast where we can have the conversation about we like this work. But there are some things that are going to have to change going forward, especially with the MCU and pop culture in general. And you guys are right. If we are going to cast and write inclusively what it will say, do it intentionally. It needs to be intentional yeah, Yeah, because it enriches the story. Right. One more thing I just want to add that we, none of us talked about is the lame coming out of Loki being bisexual. Oh, Jesus. All right. That was cringeworthy. (laughs) And Oh, I'll, I'll tell you a story after we're done recording. I have something about that, but um, that was cringeworthy. And again, this is why you need to have someone who is a head writer who is really not just hiring those diverse writing staff, but is really listening, you know, and really listening to what his members of his team or her team are really talking about. Yeah. Because I know those conversations were being had with him. I know for a fact. And and that's frustrating too, uh, you know, to, to hear that. To hear, yeah. hey, well, you I have some really I good have more advice. stories. I have more and stories. You still act it up. So, okay, so I guess since we're talking about intentionality and all that, this brings me to my last question. So, what storytelling lessons from this show did you, especially now that we've had this deep conversation, maybe the answers are different. Uh, what storytelling lessons did you pull out of Loki, and how do you think it would it will affect your writing going forward in the future? <sighs> I know it's probably rough because we've had this deep conversation. It's probably changed it all up. Well, I, I'm thinking write characters and relationships that matter for the story and not just to have them exist because you want them to be present. Does that make sense? Yes, very much so. Yeah. Yeah, I kept it short. Is that surprising for everybody? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> kind of. I mean, God, God, we're talking pop culture here. <laughs> um, so for for something... For me on this one, I think this is it, it's showing me how to write write in romance without having to write a romance novel. 
in, in kind of how it it drives character but not story um so and that's that's i don't know off again off the top of my head i'll okay. go with that i'll go with that it's a fair one all right well what about you i think um it has taught me i think our conversation especially makes me want to if i'm gonna write inclusively then i need to write nuanced and inclusive like i can't have someone who's of color and just make them all those like bad decision makers like we saw in loki i need to equally show them being the heroes and the smart ones and even with gay characters like you know really having nuance there it's really about if if i'm writing outside of my own experience that i need to show the nuances of those people in the story so that it's more balanced and it's more thoughtful, you know, cause I think a lot of what we're seeing is something that isn't thoughtful, you know, cause we can talk about intentions till we're blue in the face. We have to do better. We have to really be thoughtful and, you know, really be, um, you know, intentional in what we're doing. Yeah. And honestly, I give more grace to book writers in this than I do to TV show writers because they have a room. They have a room. There's, there's literally like, why, why are these things still happening? But, um, I mean, we know why. So I guess, (laughs) yeah, we know why. I guess the thing I would, I going back to how I felt lamentous one was just a waste of time. I would, my lesson from that show is just, Really make sure everything that you're including is there for a purpose and serves the larger story. Like I just felt like the Lamentous One thing was cool. It was visually exciting. It was fun to watch, but ultimately it offered nothing to the grander story. And it's like you, I was someone who I think I can't remember who was saying this, but it was a writer that was saying like, you know, when you're drafting, yeah, you can just write cool shit to write cool shit. But when you're revising, you need to make sure that that cool shit actually deserves to be there and and work towards the larger story, whether that's through plot or messaging or character. And I felt like Lamentis One just completely dropped the ball there. I have one more so, question for you guys. Ooh, okay. What are we talking about next? <laughs> <laughs> what are we watching next, boys? No, that's it was. Um, that- <laughs> yeah, I'm waiting for Dune to come out. Um, I'm slotted hopefully next week to go see Nine Days with Winston <gasps> Duke. Um, I've uh, been talking it up at work. I know Will um, has been talking up. I know a few people have seen it and they love it. I would actually like to have a conversation around that with you guys sometime. Maybe on or off mic, I don't care. But there's been a lot of questions brought up at work where... It's one of those films that makes you think for hours on end after you watch it about certain things. So that's all okay. I know. I haven't seen it, but that's on my playlist. Well, what I'm watching is much less serious. Um, some friends are trying to get me to watch Luca. It says a really cute little cartoon. Uh, Luca's right. awesome. I've seen well, it a couple okay, of times. Okay, Luca's good, but I'm tired of Disney teasing LGBTQ characters. Just fucking come out with it. I know. Yeah. They'll get there, I hope. But I'm with you. That's coming from the straight white guy, Disney. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> and this has been Just Keep Writing, a podcast for writers, by writers to keep you writing. You can find us at justkeepwriting.org. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Feel free to reach out to any of us on our social medias. And please jump in our Just Keep Writing Discord channel. Links to all of that is in the show notes. Lastly, please support our show by going to patreon.com slash just keep writing. We offer daily writing prompts, early access to podcast episodes, and much more. Thanks for listening and just keep writing.